In this New Year's episode, I'll be pondering life, meaning, creation, recreation, and art, and of course, horses, because yeah, it, it's all connected. This episode is part answering a student's question, part rambling, part life philosophy, and part not totally well thought out thoughts. It's reflective of the brain space that I usually get in around New Year's. So here we go. Episode 22, Recreating Art. Hi, I'm Karen Rolfe, and welcome to Horse Training in Harmony. This podcast is about you making progress with your horse in a way that you both can love. It's about learning how to move and be in harmony because yes, you really can develop a horse to be both athletic and happy. When we show up as our best selves for our horses, our horses will show up for us. So let's get started. So as I said, this episode is probably going to be a little bit meandering uh, but I, ho I hope you'll float through this with me. I want to start by just saying life is a paradox. Now, I love paradoxes. I love living in that weird space where I'm holding two seemingly opposite thoughts at the same time. Now, dressage naturally is a result of that, right? Because back, back in the day, you know, dressage and natural horsemanship seemed mutually exclusive. So I, I love wandering around in these spaces where it seems like two things are at the same time. You know, the early bird gets the worm and good things come to those who wait, right? There's the paradox. They're both true, neither are true, uh, and really it's about figuring out when one of them is true and when the other one is. And often it's a little bit of a combination. Now, right now, especially, well, probably throughout history for humans, but right now especially, we live in a very polarized time right versus wrong, my way versus your way, black versus white. And I think we humans like to put things in nice, neat categories, right? In some ways, it does make it easier. However, the truth is in the middle. And that messy middle can be hard. It can be hard because there's no easy answers to memorize and to, to fortify yourself with. The messy middle, on the other hand, <laughs> is easy because you don't have to hold on to anything, right? It the messy middle requires you to actually stay nimble and to stay thoughtful and to stay extremely aware. Now, because of this, the, the, because there's no uh, easy answers to memorize, right, and, and things to fortify your point of view with, um, the middle can be confusing. As the example I gave before, the early bird gets the worm and good things come to those who wait. So the middle is confusing. Now, anybody here who's studied with Tony Robbins uh, knows that when anyone stands up and in the middle of his seminars and says, but Tony, I'm confused. Everyone uh, that knows will start cheering and he'll start celebrating, you know? And so, and, and the person standing there like, why are you cheering? I just said, I'm confused. So the idea is that when you're confused, it means you're beginning to transform. When you're confused, you suddenly look around and realize that the old way of looking things, looking at things, no longer seems to make sense. And that confusion is often the doorway 
to trying to figure out another way of looking at it. And so that's why we celebrate confusion. Wait a second. That doesn't make sense. (laughs) I thought it was one way. And now it seems like it's another way. Celebrate. Live in that space. That's a moment where you're living in paradox. You're living in the messy middle. Don't try to get out of there too quickly. And we humans can. We want to grab onto something. We want to grab onto a dogma, grab onto a rule, grab onto a label. And see if you can just not for a minute. Now there's a quote. (laughs) And this quote I actually uh, saw on a bumper sticker. And I don't know who said it, but it's stuck in my mind. And I have a little book where I write down quotes and uh, I wrote it down in there and it said, when spirit, ex- <laughs> let me start again. It says, when experience moves beyond words, life begins to have meaning. And I, that really sp- spoke to me about these moments where we're like, wait a minute, this isn't making sense. These two things are conflicting, but they're true at the same time. And I don't even have words for that. Yes, stay there. Now, the one part of that quote about life having meaning, I actually don't think that anything means anything. I don't think anything has any inherent meaning except for the meaning that we give it. And now it's okay to give something meaning as long as you know that it's all invented, right? So I don't believe that I'm meant to do something. Oof, that's a lot of life pressure. (laughs) Oh my gosh, I'm meant to do it? (laughs) Now I have to do it? That's a lot of pressure. And, you know, when something happens, you know, if, so, if, if you feel like it has an inherent meaning, then again, that's a lot of pressure. You either have to figure it out or what if you don't like what it means? You know, you have to live with that. So I think we get to choose whatever meaning something has. And like I said, it's okay to give it meaning. I lots of times will give something meaning, but I know that it's my meaning I'm giving it. And you know, sometimes I'll try to give something meaning to usually to help me feel better about something. But the next layer, the deeper layer, instead of trying to figure out the meaning, just try to figure out what can you learn from it? It's not even a lesson. No one's teaching you a lesson. Life just happens. And you don't have to learn a lesson or figure out why that was meant to happen. I just think it happened. And what is there to learn from it. So (laughs) with that said, I still love that, uh, that quote of when experience moves beyond words, life begins to, maybe it's not have meaning. Maybe it's just life begins to happen. (laughs) That's when you're in it. When words aren't good enough, when it doesn't really make sense. Stay there. So now (laughs) running on to some other random thought here. No, it's all connected. Uh, I think this will all, this will all connect. So for me, instead of having this meaning that I'm meant to do and I lessons I'm supposed to learn and boy, I better get it right. I think life is really just a series of recreations creation, recreation, recreate again, change it a little bit more, create, recreate. Life is definitely not a straight line for sure. And so much stress that I've seen with myself (laughs) and with other people has come from when I, or when I've seen other people do this, trying too hard to get to the end of the line that they started on. When you try too hard to reach the end point of the trajectory 
that you started on without noticing that it was time to switch to a different track. And this is where I think the, the meaning or the lesson comes in. You know, if, if I'm thinking I meant to do this, I meant to do this calling or I meant to do it and I get a little too specific about what that's supposed to look like, then that can hold me on a trajectory when I need to change it. And so an, an example, um, you, know, you could say, oh, I meant to do horses. I don't know. I just like doing horses. <laughs> I'm not doing it because I think I meant to. I just do it because I love it. But there was a point in my life where, you know, as a dressage professional, I thought I was meant to follow this certain track and follow really in the footsteps of my instructor, uh, who was a, a trainer, rider, competitor, and she was a judge. And she's a good judge. She's one of the top judges in the world right now. And um, she wanted me to follow in her footsteps. And so did I. I mean, I really looked up to her and I admired her and I loved the education. And one of the hardest decisions I made in my life was when I realized that I didn't want to be a judge. I, I liked the information. I would have been proud to have completed it, but I didn't want to be living that life. But for a long time, I kept myself on that track because I thought that being a trainer, competitor, and judge was the trajectory of somebody who's meant to be a dressage professional. So when I finally listened to myself for reals <laughs> and I jumped to that track and I told her and realized, you know what? It, it was okay. <laughs> it was not only okay, but it was, it really just was such a sigh of relief. And that allowed me to accelerate on the path that I'm on now. And I'm not even going to say this is what I meant to do. I just like doing it. Right. So when you live in this middle place, you don't have to hold on. You don't have to hold on to what you think you're supposed to be doing. Whether that's big picture stuff like career choices or life decisions, marriage, divorce, where you're going to live, moving to a different city, a job, or little things like, should I ride my horse in the arena or out <laughs> with a bit or not? Right. So I think as we do anything, we do everything. And so we can practice, we can practice um, letting go of our meanings and what we're supposed to be doing and live in these magic moments where we get to decide where we're not really sure what we should do today. Great. Stay there. Swim in that moment for a little bit and see if there's a, a pull, see if there's a, a feel, a realization, an awareness that you might not have noticed if you were busy doing what you thought you were supposed to do. Now, on the other hand, <laughs> paradox, there's also, for as much stress as people have experienced by holding on to a track that they thought they were supposed to be on until they reach the, the end point of that trajectory, there's also been a lot of regret that's come from people being afraid to allow themselves to actually be pulled where that current is taking you. <laughs> the early bird gets the worm and good things come to those who wait, right? So I'm just saying two opposite things, right? So because sometimes there is a pull, sometimes there is a desire, and sometimes it, that's hard and it takes work or it's scary or you're not sure if you think you can. And so fear can hold you back. And so there are some people who jump from one track to the other track to the other track to the other track, and it's not working for them. It's not going to get you where you want to go. You're not going to be happy. And so how do you know? How do you know which to do? Jump the track <laughs> or allow yourself to be pulled? Well, I don't know. You're, that's the life's work. 
How are you going to figure that out? How do you know what to listen to? And so that's going to be figuring out how to listen to your heart versus your head, how to make sure you're acting from love and not from fear. So always be acting in a way that you're moving towards, you know, love. And you'll have to figure out what that feels like. And that you're not making decisions from fear. And you're going to have to figure out what that feels like. So that's the paradox, right? To have a vision and be brave enough to follow it. Yet still be willing to jump to a different track when needed. And that's what I mean by life is a series of recreations. Every moment is different. Every moment is new. So to use myself as as an example again, you know, my pull, my desire, my love is towards um, empowerment. I would have said horses and I could say horses and that is true, but really it's empowerment. It's empowerment through horses. I love horses. So my empowerment is going to come through horses, of course. Right. But that's, that's the pull. And I have to be not afraid to follow that pull yet at the same time, willing to switch tracks because how I'm doing horses and how I'm doing emp- empowerment is com- is transforming all the time. It's different now than it was two years ago. It'll probably be different five years from now. It's different than it was 20 years ago and 30 years ago. That's for sure. Right? So allow myself to be pulled towards what I love and not held back by fear. And there's been plenty of fear along the way. Oh my God, who am I to write a book? (laughs) Can I really go to Australia to teach lessons? Oh my gosh, that's scary. You know, can I really make an online course? Can I really have instructors? Can I really teach seminars to other equine professionals on how to help them with their business? Lots of times that fear could have stopped me in my tracks and maybe just tread water or avoid things from one side to the other. And how do we do that with our horses too? There's a, um, there's a great quote by Maya Angelou. I love her. (laughs) You just sit down with any Maya Angelou book, just, just pick a random page, such a beautiful, beautiful author. And her quote is life is pure adventure. And the sooner we realize that, the quicker we'll be able to treat life as art. I just love that. Recreation. That's what life is. And, you know, the art of life, I think, is to navigate, like I said, these pushes and these pulls and these goals and these transitions. So (laughs) now I'll ramble into the next part of this (laughs) this muse musings Uh, recently in the dressage naturally land Facebook group, there was a student who shared. um, I love that she shared this and um, said that she had been thinking about this concept of, you know, what's the art of dressage and saying, she was saying that she was kind of struggling to take, her skills into anything that felt artful, even though she said a lot of stuff was going really well. So I asked her the question, what was her definition of art? And then she went on, she was like, huh. (laughs) And she went on to say that she thought art was what was in an art gallery. And that when she thinks of art, she thinks of the great masters and the decades of dedicated study. And then, so I pointed out after that, you know, we're doing commenting in this thread in the Facebook group. 
um, there are some good things that come from Facebook, and uh, especially in the Dressage Naturally Land group. This is what we talk about. I think this is so cool. And other students are chiming in. This has actually ended up being a really interesting thread and other people were giving their, their opinions and it was, it was a funny thread. It was funny, insightful, deep, and um, yeah, and interesting all at the same time. So after she said, you know, the art was something done by masters hanging in an art gallery, I said, well, maybe, that explained how she may be having trouble feeling like she's doing art because that's a pretty high standard, right? It's not art unless you've um, worked hard for decades to master it enough to be hanging in an art gallery. So I asked her the question, and you can think about this too, if an unknown person with no credentials goes into the woods and creates something and no one is there to see it, is it still art? So she shared after that, that she realized that how she was framing it was kind of a matter of belief versus logic or, you know, her view and her attitude towards what art was versus what it really was. And, you know, there's choices. Like I said, you can give any, you can choose your beliefs. You can choose the meaning. So she was giving the word art a certain meaning. And she's starting to realize that that's a choice. You know, it's a matter of her belief. So she said that, you know, and I love that she hung in there and she was just like pondering this. And it was such a cool discussion. So she said she realized that she had been searching, what she said was searching for an emotional something that would allow her brain um, to accept the connection of her experiences to the concept of what art is. And that was, I think, such a really cool realization. She was searching for an emotional something that would allow her brain to accept the connection of her experiences to the concept of what art is. Pretty cool. So, you know, what I went on to, to talk about was you know, this, our brains are so quick to point out if we're not good enough, right? You're, you know, oh, your experience with your horse, that's not good enough to be considered art, right? <laughs> our brains are so quick to give us those messages, right? Or the comparison to others. Well, that felt really good, but I mean, Nuno Oliveri did it much better than that. <laughs> so that comparison that it's not good enough rears its ugly head and it actually prevents us from experiencing all the joy that actually could be possible right in this moment. There's a quote from the artist Mark Chagall, who says, if I create from the heart, nearly everything works. If from the head, almost nothing. So to me, that just emphasizes, you know, sometimes we have to turn off our brains and say, thank you, brain, for those messages. Now be quiet so I can be in my art, <laughs> right? So, so the student was really onto something when she said she's looking for an emotional something that could allow herself. And what I would say is just allow yourself. So, and that's what I did. My next comment to her was, you know, I, I hereby give you permission <laughs> to call yourself an artist. So for me, the art of horsemanship uh, is really less about performance although 
a performance can certainly be artistic, but it's really about being fully present in the moment. And from there, you can flow with all the choices and all the possibilities that present themselves without judgment. That's the tricky part. (laughs) And if you can live in that moment and let all the possibilities and choices float around you and you can stay there being confused (laughs) long enough to drop in and give yourself a moment to, to feel the pull, to get the wisdom, the inner wisdom, that's the place you can share with your horse. That's where horses live. So that's the art. I think the art of horsemanship is the art of sharing that moment with your horse. He's already there. It's creating from the heart, not your head. Mark Chagall, if I create from the heart, nearly everything works. If from the head, almost nothing. And so that sharing of the moment, it can be experienced in fancy movements. It can be experienced in bridalist one tempies and passage and, you know, jumping a seven foot jump, whatever it is that you're doing, whatever your discipline is, it sure can be experienced in those fancy moments. But also, it could be experienced in just standing with your horse and breathing together and sharing that moment. In fact, I recommend trying to start there. (laughs) Start with the easier moments and be in that art because then you can take it forward with you through the challenges of higher level maneuvers. Start in the simple. It's not less than. That's a profound moment, no matter what you're doing. So we can all experience art when we give ourselves permission to. And that's really all it takes. Because art's everywhere. Henry David Thoreau said, it's not what you look at that matters. It's what you see. Art is everywhere. Art is in a cloud, in a flower, in the pattern of your horse's hair after the rain. I'll tempt you to go take a peek at um, my personal Instagram. It's under Rolf Karen, R O H L F K A R E N, all together. And it's full of what I consider art. Now, I'm not hanging in any galleries. I'm not considered a great master (laughs) in the art world. But I think it's art. Feels like art to me. It's not paintings. It's not sculptures. It's photographs. It's photographs on my iPhone with no post-production editing. It's pictures that I take of things that I find or I notice that already exist. So go take a look. It's my shoes on the sidewalk. It's my dog's coat. It's a leaf with holes in it. (laughs) It's a weed growing through a crack in the cement. It's already there. I didn't make it, but I I consider the pictures that I take art because I saw them. And actually, it's art. When does it become art and not just a weed growing through the cement? When I notice, that's when. I don't even need the picture. The art is in the noticing. It's when you're walking down the street and you see a scrap of paper with a really cool shadow because of the way the sun is hitting it on a textured surface. I recently um, took a picture of a traffic sign that it was probably defective. The coating, outer reflective coating was peeling off. 
It was beautiful. So I took a picture of it. So the noticing of it is what makes the art. So if I'm the noticer, I get to be the artist. It's already there. So being the artist isn't always about creating. It's not always about working hard. It's about recreating by noticing. It's already created once and it gets recreated in our awareness. We can give the art life. You can give the art life. You make it art. Now we've all probably seen movies. That's art. That's somebody's art. And it is, it's art and they crafted it. And if they do it well, a scene in a movie can bring up a feeling or a memory deep inside of us. And you know what else can? A breeze. Have you ever sat at a, there's a certain temperature and a certain kind of breeze? I can sit on my back deck and I can have a memory of an ocean. So that's art. If the movie's art, because it brings up an emotion, and a breeze can bring up emotion, then the breeze is art. It doesn't have to be hard. You're the artist because you noticed. The sound of horses eating hay, the birds chirping, that's music. It's art. Even if it wasn't composed or toiled over, and do birds mis make mistakes in their songs? Do leaves rustle wrong? No, they just do their thing. And we can notice or not. We can find it beautiful or not, but we can experience it. And in the experiencing, in experiencing anything that's there, we experience art. And that experience is just another layer of awareness. All you have to do is notice. And isn't that what we're always trying to strive to do with our horses? To notice, to feel them. So does it have to be a perfect high level performance to be art with our horses? No. Just like the breeze blowing through the leaves or a weed growing out of a crack in the cement. There are artful moments all around us if we give ourselves permission to notice them and feel them. The shadow of your horse on the grass, the way you sweep his forelock away from his eye, the way you notice the quality of the sound of his hooves on different surfaces, the way you notice the change in his eye when he understands something. The choices that you make that you can't explain, but somehow you just know. That is art. Gustav Klimt has a quote, and he says, art is a line around your thoughts. I love that. So if you can step inside this circle of creation, recreation, you are an artist. And that cycle is being open, noticing what's already there, taking in that creation, experiencing it so that you can recreate it. So it can be noticed and experienced again. And knowing that it's always going to be different as you go through that cycle over and over again, it's always going to be different because every moment is different and that's okay. It's never about holding on, not with our horses, not with life. So you are the consistency. You being your authentic, feathery self floating in the breeze of life. And the paradox <laughs> is to allow yourself to float without being random and to develop reproducible results without grasping and limiting yourself. 
And that's the art of life, navigating that. <laughs> no one can tell you exactly how to do it. But let's admit it, our horses can sure tell us <laughs> when we're off track. And they tell us when we're on track too. So the art of horsemanship is to have a plan and be willing to change it. To be able to go with the flow and yet still be a leader. And maybe if we practice this in every area of our life, we'll get better at it for our horses. So notice the art that's already around you. And in noticing the art, you become the artist. Thank you for listening through my musings on life and creation and art. Happy New Year. <laughs>